Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you another really awesome guest involved in creating a better tomorrow for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by David Zuniga, who is Senior Director of In Space Solutions uh, at Axiom Space, which is a space infrastructure developer. They're located in Houston, Texas. Uh, they plan human space flight for various government funded and commercial astronauts engaging in in space research in space manufacturing and space exploration and they ultimately aim to own and operate the world's first commercial space station uh and david is involved in helping grow the strategy around the uh axiom's low earth orbit economy um philosophy also playing critical role in business and technological integration of their in space manufacturing and research capabilities uh david has over uh, two decades of experience uh, through engineering and business development in human space flight uh, as well as the Department of Defense, developing system architecture, technology for deep space systems uh, involving the Constellation, the Orion, and the Gateway programs. Uh, he was a certified principal engineer for Orion's air revitalization system. Uh, he was a sub-system uh, manager for the NASA Gateway program for environmental control and life support systems uh, there and, and being involved in various requirements and certification of criteria for those architectures. Uh, he's also helped to evolve the strategy and growth for low Earth orbit commercialization through the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, uh, where he helped create the pipeline and manage a broad portfolio for aerospace technology development projects on the International Space Station. He's also served on numerous committees around uh, human spaceflight safety and commercialization, been invited to speak on behalf of uh, NASA headquarters per the ISS mission. Uh, and then also uh, in the past, he was a recipient of the top prize at NASA's Ignite the Night competition through the NASA iTech, uh, while serving as managing director for um, the Danish Aerospace Company North America Division. Uh, David earned his bachelor's and master's of science uh, in mechanical engineering for Texas A&M University. He also holds graduate certification in space resources from the uh, Colorado School of Mines, where he studied a broad range of topics, including space policy, economics, and space resource utilization. A lot of really interesting themes, exciting topics to get into today. Uh, we're honored to have him with us today. Uh, David Zuniga, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is mine. It's uh, it's awesome having you, David. I you know I, I I took some time you know reading up on sort of everything you've been involved in um, uh, the last couple of decades. I, I pulled down your thesis uh, back at Texas A and M, looking at all sorts of interesting magnesium alloys that have uh, interesting properties ultimately to uh, uh, to reduce uh, corrosion and all sorts of insults that may occur in space. Saw so you were involved in subsea research, involved in uh, flame retardant technology technologies on aircraft. So basically everything you need when you're thinking about sort of building a space station and protecting the people inside of it. Uh, take us back a little bit to the early story here. I'd love to hear your background, how you got involved in, in obviously interest in science, interest in engineering, but a little bit of those early days, I think really sets the stage for a lot about what we're going to be getting into on this show. Yeah, absolutely. I, I So um, firstly, thank you again for the introduction and all those sort of um, added uh, sort of uh, context. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I kind of tell people is that, you know, I grew up in a really small town in the middle of nowhere, um, in the middle of West Texas. And um, it was a resource constrained environment by its nature. You know, there's no uh, water. We had about five inches, six inches of rain a year. Um, you know, we didn't have plumbers, electricians or anything else to sort of 
you know, do what you needed to do to go through life. So we did it all ourselves. You know, my dad was very resourceful. Um, we spent the nights, you know, looking at the sky and really just kind of, you know, being people that, you know, just wandered to the earth, I guess, around where we were. Um, but, you know, it made us really creative, it made us kind of think outside the box. And that's, that's who, you know, my family and my brother and I are by our nature. And so, you know, that curiosity was driven from that sort of growing up. Um, it also kind of gave me an appreciation for, you know, living in extreme environments and then, you know, trying to figure out what you need to um, create that, that sort of context. So, you know, putting people in um, sort of spaces where it's hard to live, um, knowing that you have to have a plan, knowing that you have to have processes to kind of come up with ways to, you know, um, go through uh, emergencies if you ever need to, and knowing what your resources are available to you and being able to utilize those was really, really important. And so, my first school I went to is Colorado School of Mines. And, um, you know, when I went there, you know, it was really kind of, uh, I was looking at geophysics and engineering at the same time. And I wanted to spend my outdoors sort of looking at uh, sort of the planet, looking at rocks and identifying what's around us. I thought that was really cool. But I also um, wanted to kind of design and build things. And that's kind of where my path led me is like that combination of understanding resources, what our planet system looks like, and then also um, figuring out how to build things around that. Eventually, um, I was able to kind of um, get a job with Lockheed Martin uh, Aerospace. And it was really, you know, putting people into high altitude aircraft um, where they couldn't survive. So I was working on life support systems at the aircraft level. And that kind of gave me my first sort of taste of what it was to put people in extreme environments on an engineering front. Um, Luckily, I found my way into aerospace through uh, Bigelow Aerospace um, uh, Company, and and we were developing the first you know space hotels. This was a commercial uh, company that was you know kind of you know founding that that infrastructure for commercial space and private space. And I was trying to figure out how to you know create these environments so people could survive in in the space environment. Um, that was after graduate school, and it really kind of led me into a place where I was able to um, sort of go into the uh, U.S. government space program and join this constellation program, like you mentioned. And, you know, where, where all this kind of led is, you know, really kind of getting my feel for how to put people in extreme environments. Um, but, you know, my combination of government and private experiments, experience sort of led me to the place where, you know, I found that, you know, there was an economic benefit to having space programs uh, be funded by sort of private entities. Um, if we could develop an economy around uh, human spaceflight, then we could probably develop a sustainable sort of mechanism that allows us to continue to do the human spaceflight. I love the Constellation programs. I love government programs, um, but they they do sort sort of go through the whims of government funding. And so, you know, some some years we might have lots of funding. Some years we may not have lots of funding. And so you just kind of go through these ebbs and flows through cycles. Um, if you're looking from a private and commercial uh, sort of perspective. You can kind of control that a little bit, a little bit more, and so you're now sort of focused on the products and goods and services that you bring to the market that are able to create sustainability. So, in a nutshell, my experience and you know growing up in remote environments, um, knowing how to sort of survive in uh, sort of extreme conditions, working in private space, working in government space, sort of led me to this place where um, I could sort of look at the world from a a private space perspective, but also from a human space like perspective. And that's how, um, that's, that's a little bit about my background. Awesome. Really awesome. And, and, and along the way, you know, obviously as you're thinking of uh, keeping people alive and, and, and healthy in these extreme, you know, austere environments that we find uh, up there, um, you know, you also began thinking of, you know, once we are protecting people and, and we have them living healthy up there, um, there's things they can do, uh, there's research they can perform. And I think this is um, one of the, and I mentioned this obviously in the bio, but I, I really like you to talk a little bit about uh, your time at the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, um, the International Space Station research connection there. And, and a little bit, if you could introduce them, and we'll segue to Axiom in a, after this, uh, a little bit about, you know, how most of us don't, and I heard you talk about this one, a presentation you gave a couple of months ago, I think, um, we, we don't appreciate that we have sort of this national treasure, this lab floating above us a, a few hundred miles up there that, that is there for research. Um, talk a little bit about your time per Cassis uh, for short, um, and, and a little bit of what you learned in terms of not just getting 
research going up there, but again, the importance of of what we can learn from these resources that that are ours. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, kind of like I was saying, it's like, you know, I came from this place where I was figuring out what economies operate around human space flight. And the next natural progression for me was trying to figure out how we take an orbiting platform, it is existing today, and we utilize that to create commerce. Uh, so my job was really to kind of figure out um, the next companies that were going to change the way we um, sort of behave in space, the way we sort of bring products to space, the way we sort of bring an economy to space. Uh, my focus was around aerospace technology and remote sensing. And so I was looking at companies that really were kind of looking at the Earth from an Earth observation perspective and figuring out how they can use data uh, to then um, develop those use cases for, um, let's say, uh, gosh, uh, market prediction, uh, weather intelligence, um, re really just kind of giving more insight about what's going on in the planet. And, you know, it was really exciting to try to figure out how to reach out to companies who are building satellites, uh, people who are building data platforms, uh, people who are even just kind of experimenting with technology to figure out what they could do um, in space so that they could support uh, people on the ground. Um, so that gets into things like, you know, developing pharmaceuticals or developing new materials. And so um, my job was really to kind of pull together those those different pipelines um, that would enable a, um, a laboratory in space to be able to facilitate those different markets. Um, it was a very new sort of concept um, because the National Lab has not you know, it hadn't really been around to be able to facilitate science and research in space commercially. Um, you know, NASA had really kind of funded a lot of these programs and taken it into a very exploration centric uh, sort of uh, direction. Uh, but my job was to try to figure out what those, those terrestrial use cases and those benefits would be. And so it's really exciting doing that. And uh, that's how I kind of jumped into what I'm doing today. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, let's um with that, let's um segue over to Axiom uh space now. And again, um the, the sort of the, the company has sort of an evolution going on now in the sense that you have uh the sort of a services component in in working to again help companies and um you know building this infrastructure getting experiments up to the iss currently but at the same time uh, this uh it's not that long term actually but sort of this plan to have um uh, a private space station of your own um and, and i have to say i may you know i was a child of the the late 60s early 70s big fan of 2001 space odyssey and clearly you know from a young age i always wanted to hang out and stay at that it was the Hilton or the Howard Johnsons on the on the one they had in the movie, but nonetheless, uh, talk of, take us a little into the background of the of the company first and foremost, and we'll, we'll obviously be getting into a lot of the research themes. But um, you know, talk about the, the people behind it. Uh, you know, where the you know somebody said one day, "Hey, I'm going to put my own space station up there." Uh, take us a little into the background story, if you would. Yeah, no, so interesting, you know, it's, um, you know, people have been sort of concepting this idea of, you know, hotels in space, like you said, Space Odyssey 2010, uh, having people, um, you know, just kind of live and work in space. And that's really the genesis for our company. Um, like you said, uh, well, like we had talked about the, the National Lab, um, you know, was kind of a start for that. Um, it started around 2007, CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, the organization I work for, um, to help to kind of spur this economy around um, the ISS National Lab, um, started around 2011. And so we kind of see the, the roots of all these things kind of starting in the 2000s, where we're actually, and I'm not going to say that's the first time people have these ideas, but it is the first time in which you know, SpaceX was getting um, some private or some uh, government funds to, you know, fly its or develop its own rocket systems for human space flight. Private companies were starting to get their um, funding to be able to do this. You had the National Lab that was established. You had Bigelow Aerospace, companies like that, that were kind of kind of noodling around with these space habitat hotel, um, private, private space station concepts. And again, back in 2000s. And so we as a company, um, you know, had these ideas that were already happening. But, you know, through the initiatives of, of a lot of us, so our CEO, for example, Mike Schiffredini, uh, was a program manager for the National Space Station National Lab. Um, he had a huge part in sort of building and constructing and sibling and operating the space station. Um, you have folks like myself who were building um, 
commerce through the national international space station national lab uh, you have people like my boss who is building research and development portfolios from inside of nasa and so you just have this con conglomeration of people that sort of got their talents together or got their at least past experiences together to build this company where we could actually build a space station assemble a space station operate a space station um, build the portfolios that we need figure out what it takes to build a business around microgravity research and then building those markets around that future end state, which is really just an orbiting platform um, that has um, a low Earth economy, low Earth orbit economy sort of built around that. So it's really becoming a global space market from there. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, um, we really kind of we're building prosperity through the opportunity of kind of building that economy. Talk about, um, you know, cause they're, you know, basically these three, core platforms um per the um uh, sort of the i say the research infrastructure there that that you're going to be well building but then providing uh these services to others uh one uh which is called microgravity advantage another extreme environments and the third piece of this sort of the the operational orbital lab and you know looking at some of this stuff and i i, I come out of the uh sort of the biotech space uh and one of the exciting things that's going on in, in our domain lately is sort of this reconnection of, of the world of biology and physics and, and, and some of the things that you know you talk about here in terms of what you can explore uh when you have say microgravity like you know all the interesting shear stresses and and the way sedimentation rates change and so forth in microgravity uh we we're never able to study that <laughs> down here where we got gravity um the same thing with the extreme environments whether things like radiation or low oxygen levels or all the things that uh you know contribute to disease are part of pathogenesis again a very unique system there walk us through the core platforms if you would and then coming out of that let's jump into a little bit about sort of the the future orbital lab will look like knowing this or if it's a it's a work in progress yeah no absolutely um so you know, like I said, there's been a group of us that have seen research portfolios go through the ISS National Lab and seen it go through um, NASA's pipeline through um, exploration initiatives. So you have things like space medicine, you have, you know, long duration space flight, um, you have things that are geared towards pharmaceutical development, yeah. and then things that are geared, for, uh, geared towards material development. And all that happens, like you said, because of the physics. Um, so the really cool thing about microgravity is it does give us that unique data point that we just simply cannot get on earth. Yeah. Um, so everything um, is affected by gravity from the cellular growth to um, the way materials evolve and form um, through crystal growth. And then when you look at trying to do that stuff in space, um, you start to kind of observe different phenomena. Um, things, again, we couldn't really predict because we didn't have a different environment in which to predict it. You know, there are no models that were kind of evolved that way. Um, so like you said, sedimentation, buoyancy, uh, convection are all really yeah. important factors in how we formulate anything that that sort of has evolved on the planet. Um, and those change um, based on your different uh, place in space. So, you know, if you look at the moon, if you look at Mars and you look at all these different sort of bodies around the universe, you're going to find um, those formulations being different. So what microgravity in low Earth orbit does today is it gives us that first data point so that we can start to extrapolate what the other pieces look like. So what yeah. does one day look like, but how do we sort of predict that model? So if we at least have two data points, we can start to extrapolate what things on the moon uh, look like in terms of the formation and Mars and then beyond. So from the physics and the science perspective, um, you know, we're, we're this really tiny place in history um, where we're starting to explore and discover, um, but at least we're pushing that edge and then we're starting to, to begin that journey on how we really continue to understand the universe. So I love that part about our microgravity sort of platform. And, you know, as far as, you know, the, the things that we want to sort of go into and um, in, in our orbital um, um, sort of laboratory environment, um, we, you know, as a business um, have to be able to um, make money to keep the doors open and pay our employees sure. to build a space station and all that stuff, right? And so we actually have a good sense of where research and where manufacturing um, and where the sort of lower Earth orbit economy can grow from a from a depot perspective. Um, so we start there with our instincts. We kind of say, okay, we think this area is really big. So let's look at um, 
Let's look at uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, because we've all been studying pharmaceuticals for a while. Yep. And then you start to kind of look at where the markets could potentially push terrestrially, because, you know, kind of at the beginning of my talk, I was talking about sort of the economy is really pushing why we do what we do and then the infrastructure that we build out in the future. And so we really kind of build and involve those markets prior to really going into one, uh, one specific area. So a lot of what our team does is really go assess based on the science, based on um, the trends in, uh, in space, or based on manufacturing trends, we go and try to figure out where the market um, is the best. You know, where can we have the bi biggest, high, highest rate of return? Where is it feasible to do the work? Um, what infrastructure do we have in place already? Because we're building a space station that can support the work. And then how do we then continue to evolve our space station to maybe draw further into that market. And those are the things that we kind of do to make sure that we build the, plat the right platform. I mean, like you said, it's still being built, but we're, we're in a place where we can kind of evolve and push that needle just a little bit further. So our space station is gonna look a little bit different from the ISS. And then the space stations after that are gonna do the same thing. They're gonna kind of continue to evolve and then follow the models that the market really drives. And so that's how we're building our space station. So. You know, we like pharmaceuticals, we like uh, semiconducting materials and materials development. Um, and our job is really to build a platform in which somebody can see, succeed and build a, a manufactured product from space to go enable their market. So if somebody has a $2.5 billion pharmaceutical market, for example, we want to be able to um, enable that market because it's a faster pharmaceutical development or it has uh, better properties um, or it's you're doing something in space that can't be done in a gravitational field. Mm -hmm. And we see that all over the place. Um, artificial retinas are a really good example of that. Um, when you look at artificial retinas, they're you know maybe 40, 50% effective, um, which is great. You're restoring somebody's eyesight, um, but you're still, um, the, the economic drivers for getting um, the material and everything that you need to, to get that implant in place are huge. Um, you're spending, you know, on the orders of tens of thousands of dollars uh, to be able to get uh, retinal implants. Um, when you look at the way you manufacture a retina in space, uh, you kind of look at the um, sort of the curvature of that retina and you kind of can envision that gravity is going to pull that down and warp its optical properties, which is yeah. why the effectivity goes lower. But if you look at space, you don't have gravity that's affecting the development of that retina, that 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 manufacture of the retina. You don't have gravity pulling it down. And so the optical properties are more pure and they're able to provide, um, or theoretically able to provide uh, better uh, vision than that you would have with a with a retina that's manufactured in space. So those are the types of things that really make sense to fly. Also retinas, for example, the material to, to make them in uh, gross cells in space is actually really small mass. Right. Uh, and then the return of that is really small mass. And in space, launch costs are all, all sort of uh, the, the biggest dominating factor in the cost of uh, really making something in space. 70% of the cost of a program, for example, goes towards the rocket fuel to send something to space. Mm. Uh, so, you know, if you're able to kind of reduce the mass of something um, that you're manufacturing space, um, you can bring that product um, more feasibly back down and sell it competitively in the marketplace with a higher uh, performance yield. So that's those are the applications that we're really interested in pursuing. And that's how we see our laboratory growing and our economy growing. Yeah, I, I very much, and, and everyone listening and watching, if you, if you go to the Axiom Space, there's a, there's a nice little overview of um, the, uh, the retinal, implant manufacturing that, that Dave was just talking about. And I, I really enjoyed as I reading reading through that uh, and, and and again, thinking of, uh, as you were saying, the, the sedimentation rates, the convection flows, the membrane potentials, all the stuff that, you know, when the retina is produced originally, you know, when we're in our mother's wombs and so forth, all that stuff comes into play. It's not just, you know, blam, here's some stem cells and, you know, we get a retina tomorrow. And, and I really thought it was quite elegant, uh, that particular story. So I encourage everyone listening and watching to, to go read about that one. Um, David, that that being said, could you say a few words about, because I know in, in my own sort of past experience um, with talking with folks at the, the National Lab, um, there was things that, right, like, so, you know, if I, if I am producing XYZ biotech thing, I not only have to teach the experiment, I forget where, if it was the Ames space, it, it was somewhere, you had to sort of teach the experiment 
had to figure out when the next rocket was going up. You had to schedule things and so forth. What, what what do you sort of envision as sort of that whole, is there going to be sort of a permanent Axiom sort of lab manage, manager hanging out on the uh, space? I mean, how does all this ultimately, uh, you know, develop in the sense of um, compared to uh, sort of the, the, the current ISS model of, of doing this stuff? That's a great question. I mean, you know, we we right now know how to build a space station. We know how to build those markets. Um, we know how to basically program the the sort of logistics and infrastructure that we need to go to, um, sort of facilitate those growing markets right now. Um, we do not yet know how to fit that all into the lexicon of how everybody else understands space. So we are going to continue to evolve that model. Today, we have a great relationship with the, with the National Space Station National Lab. Um, again, me coming from that organization, I can talk to people um, really easily um, across the uh, across the, the board um, to you know help us help us facilitate what the intent of what we want to go do is. So we want to go fly a thing. We want to go fly some technology or development or some research that we're going to go uh, develop for a customer. And everybody's on board. They're like, "All right, let's figure out how to do this." And so we step by step figure out how to do it in in sort of the infrastructure we have today. So luckily we have the ISS National Lab that supports um, upmass, crew time, uh, robotics use, all those facilities that the National Lab offers to a growing economy. Mm -hmm. um, and we operate um, perfectly off of that model. And in the future, um, I think we will see that sort of model uh, sort of implant into our commercial space station where you do have um, a set of government um, sort of uh, participation that allows us to be able to facilitate research that happens on a government level. Um, government-sponsored research is always going to be important. So uh, we do anticipate that happening. Um, we are having conversations today uh, with other government agencies that really help us to um, sort of lead the way in those, in those dialogues where we blend what happens with funded research today and our space station of tomorrow, which is not that far away. Um, so we're having those real conversations on how to actually make that happen. Um, we'd like to see flights go up. So today we buy space flights, uh, we, buy, we buy SpaceX flights commercially. So uh, that's the way we we sort of send our, or we'll send our modules to space and we send our private crews to space. Um, so right now we're um, sort of operating on a business business transactions uh, with SpaceX and we're happy that they're there and the service provider and we wanna see that, that sort of economy grow. Um, and we're also working with the uh, ISIS National Lab and government agencies to make sure that we facilitate government research and all the valuable things that we do from a from a government perspective. So we're kind of in this this place where we are um, uh, an operator of a space station that can enable both uh, sort of um, initiatives to happen. So we're we're right where we want to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah, it just mentioning SpaceX. I mean, one of the guests I had on the uh, the show uh, last year was um, uh, Colonel um, Doc, Colonel Doctor Samantha Weeks, who is sort of heading up sort of research per the Polaris Dawn missions, uh, and and some of her stuff was uh, again, you know, focused on you know human experience. You know, if you spend a couple minutes out there in the vacuum and, and, and so forth, what happens to your heart and your eyeball and all that stuff. Uh, visions for ultimately, you know, for human stuff, obviously beyond the the stem cells and the, and the artificial tissues and all the other cool things you can do pharmaceuticals, any other longer term stuff that you can talk about that uh, when it comes into not just what we can learn for, you know, how these, austere environments impact health and benefits here, but also obviously thinking about Mars and beyond. Um, any other interesting stuff on that front you could say? Yeah, um, basically we'll have a space station. <laughs> so we, we, we must use it, you know? Yep. Uh, so if, if NASA is wanting to go out and figure out um, how to continue to use our platform to understand um, how exposure to human um, health will happen uh, for longer and longer durations, uh, we want to keep enabling that. Um, and our vision is to, again, kind of really build this robust uh, low Earth orbit economy. Um, but we see that 
a trend that goes further and further out um, away from the planet. So as we get good at Leo, we want to go out to moon and then Mars and beyond. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we don't see us stopping uh, with just the, of course, the terrestrial applications are really, really important, but we don't see ourselves stopping at that. We are spacefaring people. We are explorers. We're uh, naturally curious and, you know, we're building for the beyond. So we want to make sure that we, we uh, continue to enable that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about pharma, we talked about implants, um, you mentioned things about sort of advanced materials, and I know the website talks about things like alloys and fiber optics and all that stuff. What else gets you excited in terms of the, uh, you know, low Earth orbit economy, the space economy? Um, what else do you dream about in terms, you know, is it is it asteroid mining? Is it uh, oh, other, more floating hotels? Uh, is it Jupiter? What else keeps you up at night when you think about all the cool stuff that, you, that you're potentially involved in here? Yeah, no, all those things. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I think one of the most near and present things that um, that sort of uh, makes me excited is about sort of, you know, the the aspect of bringing somebody from a living and working environment here on the ground. Let's say I'm somebody who works in a lab. Um, I've got my daily routine. I get up um, in the morning in my bed. And I get up to a watch that alerts me um, of what time it is. So it gives me a little buzz that says, all right, time to wake up. Next thing I do is I read the news and that's all done digitally. You know, there's a lot of electrons that are flowing um, from the from the moment I work, wake up. And then I go do some other things. I get navigation on um, and I figure out what the best route is uh, to my commute to work. It's a 35 minute commute to work. So there's car accidents, there's all sorts of things that happen in the world that, you know, I can learn more about my navigation through my navigation system. And then I go and get to work and I pop up in my laptop and all sorts of data hits me. And that happens, that whole process happens through the time I go to bed. Um, it, it could be a fortunate thing or unfortunate thing. I do unplug. So um, it's, it's important to do that, I think. But that is the reality of where I live today. Doing that in low earth orbit is not trivial. Um, flying a cell phone um, is not trivial. So it was really interesting sort of bringing our first, um, through our first mission AX-1, uh, bringing those folks into space. Um, and, you know, they're all successful um, uh, folks in, in the industries that they uh, service. And, you know, having no connection to cell phone, no connection to, or uh, less connection to email, uh, less sort of that, that connectedness back to the planetary things that you do every day was a big change for them. And if I think for the future about space stations, we shouldn't be maintaining the space station from a person perspective every minute of the day. We shouldn't be worried about flying the space station, making sure that it's in orbit, it's doing what it should be doing. I, I see this sort of a as a sort of automated thing that our space stations will do for the people inside. Um, I see us using data uh, more freely. I see us, you know, uh, being able to um, do the social media things that we want to do, uh, email, communicate, use a cell phone, uh, sort of like the Space uh, Space Odyssey 2010 uh, example that you gave. That was a great picture of like, you know, um, father was calling his daughter on the AT&T telephone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he he's, picks up and is like, hey, honey, how are you? And it's her birthday. And they have this little dialogue. Those things don't happen in space today. And, um, you know, what excites me is getting to that sort of vision of how you make a space, space station do all those things. Uh, we want to manufacture in space. We want to do research in space. We want to uh, uh, do all the terrestrial things we do in space. And that's not a reality today. And that's kind of the exciting part of um what I want to sort of practically do, at least in my career. Um, I do get excited, super excited about space mining um, and situ resource utilization and, and being able to research, use the resources around you is really important. Um, but the stepping stone to get there is making an operable um, sort of platform in which we start to kind of figure out how to live off the planet. Yeah. And that's super exciting. Absolutely. Really exciting. Um... David, while we have you, I, I noticed that um, a couple months ago you you were at South by Southwest. Um, you got the Spacecom uh, Expo coming up, I think, at the end of this year. Any other major sort of public facing uh, events going on that you want to mention? Places that we can listen to you, possibly meet you. Anything else hot on the schedule for 2023? Please take the floor. 
I think, um, you know, I, I'm doing some uh, public outreach with HPE and um, I just did some um, at their HPE Discover conference um, this past uh, this past week. Yeah. And I'm really excited about sort of speaking about data uh, anywhere and everywhere. Um, I know some more folks are going to uh, make some uh, sort of um, uh, presence at uh, Ascend in November, and uh, that's held in Las Vegas. And uh, I may I may be there, and uh, but I uh, would be super excited to to kind of talk to anybody that's around. Awesome. Um... It, it, it's really great stuff. I mean, I again, uh, w when I first read about you and, and everything you you guys were up to, I I said, you know, this is this is clearly someone I wanna I wanna talk to on the show, and and just really, it's just, it's it's such an amazing uh, portfolio you have in front of you, and I really uh, wish you the best with it. Um, we're gonna keep watching as it continues to develop. Um, for everybody, again, that's going to be listening uh, to this particular episode of the show uh, across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to David Zuniga, Senior Director in Space Solutions at Axiom Space. Um, David, I, I want to thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about everything you're up to. Obviously, thank you for doing it and and and, and evolving this uh, low earth orbit economy that uh, is going to benefit all of us. And as we like to say on our show, um, you know, thanks for helping to create this amazingly better tomorrow for all of us via what you do. Really a great story. And again, wishing you the best with all of it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on.